Hello and welcome to Mr Beasley Teaches and this video which is going to focus on the poem The Piano by D.H. Lawrence. This is primarily a poem about memory and the way in which memories can be triggered by sensory experiences like sound and music. There's a powerfully nostalgic mood created in this poem which is enhanced by the poet's use of the first person which makes the account seem more personal and therefore more heartfelt. The poem is organised into three stanzas of four lines each with an AABB rhyme scheme which I've illustrated for you here. The first two of these stanzas are thematically connected to the events in the past while stanza three brings it back to the present and the impact this memory has on the speaker. The personal and sensitive mood of this poem is signalled right at the start through the use of the adverb softly, followed by the setting of dusk, which is that time just before sunset, and this creates a quiet and intimate feel at the start of the poem. The fact that the woman is singing softly, and apparently only to the speaker when it's close to dark, gives the implied song the superficial qualities, at least, of a lullaby. We don't know where it is that the speaker is hearing this song, and neither do we know if, indeed, he is the sole intended audience for it, but the speaker feels that she is singing to him, and clearly the song has some personal meaning and significance for him. The punctuation at the end of this first line encourages the reader to pause and reflect on these things while also signalling a little bit like an ellipsis that we are now being taken back in time. The word vista that I've highlighted here comes from the word view and it's usually used in reference to a, a wide view of a landscape or panorama implying that the number of years this memory is taking him back is on an equally large scale. But vista also means a clear mental, in this case memory, of a distant time. And so the clarity of this memory, however distant, is still with the speaker. At the end of this journey into the past, the narrator arrives at a memory of a child sitting under a piano, which is what gives the poem its title. There's a really effective oxymoron at the end of this line tingling strings has a rhyme with a terrifically musical quality to it. it. It makes the music from the piano sound clear and delicate, while boom creates a contrast with this image and serves to illustrate the proximity of the boy to the source of the music, making it seem much louder. And of course the size of the boy himself, who is small relative to the size of the piano and the sound that it's making. The final line of the first stanza describes the childish actions of the boy pressing his mother's feet. Possibly, although this isn't directly stated, into the pedals of the piano. The main clues lie here. In the word poised, an adjective used to describe his mother's feet means elegant or graceful, which might suggest her precise and confident working of the pedals. The alliteration at the end of this first stanza emphasises the mother's kindness and perhaps the pleasure she gets out of her music. So, so far everything has been fairly straightforward, but the complexity of the poem increases at the beginning of the next stanza. It begins with the phrase, in spite of myself, which sort of means against his intentions or despite his efforts to stop this from happening. There's something about this memory that the speaker wants to avoid. He describes it as insidious, which means stealthy and ultimately harmful. While the word mastery conveys the power that the music has, almost to take him over completely. So the song which triggered this memory in the first place has taken him by surprise, crept up on him unexpectedly, and he is perhaps afraid about the consequences of digging this memory up. 
He even uses the word betrays in the next line to suggest that he's been tricked into having this memory by a song that he started listening to, which was never expected to have this effect. The alliterative betrays me back sounds languid and heavy, as if he's returning to this past with great reluctance. And although the reason for this isn't immediately cleared up in the next part of the poem, we do find out more detail about the memory itself. And it's a memory about Sunday evenings at home, a place where he belongs, which might hint towards his disconnected or isolated feelings now, especially when you consider structurally where this word appears right at the end of the line for maximum emphasis. This is a place where it's warm, the adjective cosy here, used to describe the space inside, acting as a counterpoint to the winter outside. And we can feel the emotion welling up inside our speaker as he tells us, the heart of me weeps. Now, at the moment, this isn't a literal crying with tears. That happens later. For now, this is just that swelling in the heart that you feel when you remember something deeply meaning or personal. There are more sensory images used here through the sound of hymns and, of course, the tinkling piano. But it's interesting that the piano is personified as a guide drawing the other members of the household towards it. And there's a suggestion of a routine created here as well through the phrase old Sunday evenings. And you've probably noticed that suddenly the me and I of stanza one has pluralised into our, adding to that sense that this is a memory of a time when the speaker felt part of a warm, cosy family who would all gravitate towards the parlour of a Sunday evening when his mother started to play the piano. Now, as with many poems, the deeper meanings and quite often the greater complexity comes at the end and the first two lines of the final stanza need a bit of unpicking. The first problem is to deal with the word vain because you're probably interpreting that word as conceited or having high regard for yourself which doesn't really work in this context but you might have heard of the word in the context of being useless or pointless like I don't know, a vain attempt to do the homework or he swam in vain against the tide and that's the intended meaning here now locates the subject of this line in the speaker's present. So he's referring to the music which led to the memory in stanza one and saying that it's ineffective or even pointless for it to try and stimulate emotion in him, however passionately it's being played. Appassionato means to perform with a great deal of emotion. The adjective clamour, which is used to describe the piano, in the narrative present sounds you know, brash and chaotic when compared to the glamour, which in turn describes the memory of the piano which has been conjured up for him. The caesura here creates a break between the clamour of the present and the glamour of the past. And so the overall meaning of this is that the passionate playing of the piano the speaker hears doesn't compare to the emotional power of his memory. The emotion that he's feeling now, triggered by memories of a past with his mother and family, is much stronger than the music he's currently listening to. And this contributes to one of the main ideas in this poem, which is that, for our speaker, the past is much better than the present. The fact that his manhood is cast down here suggests that he's just about been able to hold his emotions together until this point. He gives up on his reserved adulthood and embraces childish ways again. He 
He's been trying to keep these memories at bay, but now the floodgates are open and the memories come pouring back to him. And he weeps like a child for the past, with this final simile here creating a nice link between the present and the past. <laughs> 